Welcome everyone to this uh, seminar for um, on breeding. It's not going to be just a panel discussion. We do want to have it as a discussion overall. Again, this was something that we wanted to do because we weren't able to give it its full amount of attention that it deserved when we were at the national, because as everybody knows, we had um, such a large entry that um, we uh, had to, to kind of condense the, the time on, on several things. So, you know, thanks to technology, we are able to continue this and be able to do this. And so with that, um, I did want to say John Shaw is not going to be able to participate. He had to have a, a little medical procedure today, um, but hopefully we will uh, be, you know, as I said, be doing this again in the future because John has great information. So we will, um, you know, wish him that. On a sad note, uh, we did lose one of our breeders, one of our very long-term breeders. We lost her on Saturday. For those who don't know, Kathy Forbes passed away fairly unexpectedly. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I don't have any information yet on any um, of the services or, or um, anything like that. As soon as we get it, I will provide that. Um, but I did want to have a moment of silence in honor of Kathy. Okay, you know, and and actually, this is a good thing that we're doing to record these programs because we are losing some of this knowledge. You know, it's kind of like we were talking about before. You know, we need to keep our archive, um, and so it's great to be able to to have this. Um, again, I would ask you know if you're not a panelist, please mute yourself um, and uh, and you know and, and then come off mute as we're answering questions, things like that. Uh, Deb Weigel is running just a little bit late, so I do have um, so a couple questions. I'm to here. Get started. Oh, she's here. Okay. Well, you know what? I am then just going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to mute myself. Okay. I'm not sure how all this works. So the panelists can can talk. Yes. So um, so Brett has okay. actually muted himself just for a little bit. Um, but then we have Darlene and we have Lori. So Lori is iPhone two <laughs> on on your screen. Okay. I only have you on my screen right now. I'm on my phone. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I only have I only have whoever's talking. So you only have the the main speaker. Okay. Okay, so I have a couple of new questions and then I wrote down some of the old ones too. Um, so um, one of my newer ones was how to choose a puppy with show potential <laughs> and what's the best age to evaluate? Now, what do you do? Mm -hmm. the star of your place. Chef, tell us about your dish. It's a grapefruit cocoa nib cocktail. So Brett, why don't you go ahead and... and jump into you? it and, and answer all right uh i guess my standard answer has been perfect you when, when you have the luxury of actually raising a litter and seeing them from the get-go uh, it's always been my experience that the ones that we like become real apparent to us uh just uh Pictures and things don't tell you too much. Just watching them run around and watching them move and interact. Uh, and as far as what age, we kept ours, well, as long as we needed to. We, we, we kept more than we, we sold. So uh, that's, that'd be my answer, that, that uh, evaluating puppies, it, it's just a thing that happens as you watch them and they, they just kind of tell you I'm the one, so that's been my experience. I agree with Brett. Um, the best thing to do is to just watch them as they're growing. You can see what's going on, how they're developing. It's hard to say uh, any magic age. Uh, I think like Brett, Brett says, whenever, whenever you're able to tell because different lines mature at different rates. Um, Different, different dogs mature faster than bitches. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's an ongoing thing. But, you know, if I had to pinpoint a date, I'd, I'd say probably a year. <laughs> Before that, first, it's, just, it's just best get. Back when I first started, 
I asked this very same question of Carol Diaz of Page Mill Beagles. And some of the information she gave me, I found very valuable. Um, I agree with both of them. You have to watch your puppies. But she also said, you know, start looking at the shoulders, start looking at how stand, how comfortable, how square they stand, start watching them move. She's told me to do the final evaluation of which ones I wanted to keep at 12 weeks. I found by eight weeks, I could pretty much rule some out, but they really weren't moving really good by then. And they really didn't have their legs under them. And by 12 weeks is really when I would make my decision of, okay, these are definite pets. I thought they were all along or these aren't. Uh, it gives them time to mature a little bit. I've always encouraged people to keep them to 12 weeks. I know so many people let them go at eight weeks. And sometimes you can say, okay, this one's going to be too snipey, the muzzle. But for me, if I have two or three that I think are going to be show quality, I'll hold on to those two or three till 12 weeks of age and, and really take a look at their, their size, their shoulder layback. Uh, at that age, I don't want a puppy that looks completely balanced because I find that as they get older, they lose rear angulation. So at 12 weeks, I want a puppy with a little, little more angulation than I like and may even be a little hockey because every time I've kept one, people say, oh, it's a little hockey. By the time it's 12 years, I mean, 12 months old, he's <coughs> just right in the rear or maybe even a little bit too straight for my liking. So mm. I, I think, again, they're right. It comes with knowing how your line matures, but I think there's some basic fundamental looking of angles and the way the puppy's built. Uh, a 10 week old puppy that doesn't have any angulation is not going to get angulation. A 10 week or eight week old puppy with a low tail set is not going to get a better tail set. If they got a bad ear set, it's not going to improve. Um, size of eye is not going to improve. So all that you should be judging as the puppies grow, but it's kind of hard to do it at six weeks. And it, you kind of have to wait till they get a little bit more of that adolescent leg under them. And I just find 12 weeks is my magic number. Deb, I'm not sure. I don't think you can see the questions in chat. So I'll just kind of jump in. Um, so along those same lines, Vargab asked, you know, are you also giving weight to what the parents look like when you're, you know, comparing all of these? Yes. Uh, but again, it, you know, we have this conundrum with us especially with me where we breed 13 to 13 and you get a, a whole litter of these chunky monkey puppies that, you know, when they're six weeks old, they're not going to be 13s. So you have to adjust your, your attitude. Uh, if you know, you've got a, a, a male that's not dominant and he tends to throw certain things that you don't like um, other males will throw a lot of a good characteristics. So you've got to know what they've produced in the past, especially if it's a male that's been used to bitches with the same type pedigree that yours has, you need to look and look at that offspring and kind of talk to the people that have those offspring. Uh, my first breeding again was with Carol Diaz and Paige on the road again. And I did it because not because of what I had seen of Willie because he was on the West coast, but of what he had produced out of the bitches others owned similarly <laughs> bred to my bitch. And it was a consistent type production. So you really do. Bread or that Lori? Takes categories. Mm -hmm. Pedigrees, right. Mm -hmm. Don't look at one generation, two generations. Really go back <laughs> and look and look at different litter mates. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have one 13 yeah. inch in a litter and four big 15s, or you could have one normal <laughs> size and three oversized. And then don't be surprised if you get oversized puppies in your litter. You know, you've got to research the pedigrees, look at the pictures, talk to the people that have owned them. You know, that's the way you can kind of maybe have some input for your eye to look at what you're seeing. Right. Because if you look at dog to dog, you've got all those generations that those dogs are pulling in with it that are going to change what the puppies mm -hmm. are. You're going to have some puppies that get more resemblance from maybe dogs and, you know, two or three generations back. And you're going to get some that may resemble first generation, but you know, you can't, you can't base it entirely on the look of the parents. You have to look at the pedigree to see what's back there. Mm -hmm. And some of the people, and this is kind of get off the subject, they'll say, oh, this dog has got over angulation and this dog's too straight. So I'm going to put those two <laughs> dogs together. And we'll be yeah, good that's rears. Wrong. That's wrong. You yeah. want to take a dog with a weak rear to a dog with a good rear, not right. one that's yeah. weak too, you know, not care. 
You know, don't okay. take a short to a tall. You take a, a short to the right size um, as far as, you know, doing things. It's not like, an average type of thing. Yeah, it doesn't average out. You, you Mother Nature does not do averages. <laughs> Brett. Yeah, something I've said a lot of times uh, about our puppies and, and puppies I see is I, I call it a good frame to hang a dog on. Uh, right. I don't I don't like to see you know, a puppy that's all two, two together, little, uh, and no room for stuff to grow in there. Uh, because I do like really a dog that has some uh, upstanding, even if it's a 13, they, they just shouldn't be short on leg. They, they should have a lot of substance <laughs> and things like that when they're little. But those are things that uh, then you do an outcross and then maybe you get something that you didn't realize it's going to turn out okay, you know. So it's been, then you're bringing in new blood, and that's good to do anyway. So and you know, also talking about evaluating your puppies in the same time frame, we're going to have the temperaments. You're going to see who are the bold ones out in the yard. Who are the who are the ones that if a bird squawks, they run back to the house. Uh, you're starting to really not only look at structure, but you're starting to look at how they handle the social dynamics out in out in the, the great world because. It doesn't matter really how great that puppy is if a, you know, if a bird squawks and it runs to the house with its tail tucked, then you know it might not handle the show ring very well. Right. What about Gene Dill's system of evaluating puppies? I've used I, it a couple I, of times, all? but I, I can't tell you for sure it works for me. Yeah, we, we've it's looked right. at it. You know, back in the day, uh, and it's probably there. There's things to be learned there. Yes, I agree. The height thing does seem to work for me, but I did keep record of all my puppies' heights at every week, and I kind of developed my own little. Okay, well, I need to adjust this height or this height as far as whether they're going to be 13s or 15s. And uh, but in general, the the six and a half week height measurements pretty much work for me. <laughs> I measure for eight inches at six and a half weeks and nothing more because all I want to know is to have my head up for something that potentially could go oversize. And if I'm going to sell it as a show dog, I want to know that that possibility is there. But in all honesty, there's so much difference between different lines and different dogs that they all can have growth spurts at different times that Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but generally the eight inches at six and a half weeks is, is good, to, good to give you a good idea whether they're gonna go oversized. And if you're starting early, if you're new into the breeding, keep those records, do those measurements, keep those records of heights and weights because two or three, four generations down the road, you may see the own pattern. You may see a pattern that you can use for yourself. That's why keeping the records of what you breed and I mean, I wish I'd kept more records. I wish I remember which ones had rear dew claws or, you know, just different things like that, that now 40 years down the road, I'd love to put that information back together and see if I could find a pattern to it. Hmm. However, Darlene, um, when you're talking, it, you know, it, it, a lot depends on what age you're talking about, because I think we, we all can see birth weight means nothing. Birth weight just means where they were in the chain inside. Um, but after that, puppies can, can grow and change and change places. It's like the old thing about, oh, the smallest puppy ends up the biggest and the biggest ends up the smallest. So I think when you're looking at recording different heights, it needs to be done on out to where it becomes material, where they're big enough for it to be meaningful. I do. Yeah. I do. I measure my, I measure mine almost all the way till adulthood. It may not be every weight, but they, they're, and my final measurement for them is adulthood. When they're about a year old, I'll do my final measurement for the ones I keep. Uh, what? Deb, do you have uh, more questions? Yes. I didn't know if there was anything more in the chat there. Um, we'll kind of go back and forth. Um, I guess this sort of relates. There's a question about having dominant bitch versus dominant stud dog lines. And how do you use this to your advantage in selecting your breeding matchups? 
depends on what they're dominant for. Yeah, and who's the dominant? I mean, you can right. have the bitches that all their puppies from their litters from different sires kind of look similar, and then you can have some that don't, and and then you can have <laughs> male sires that bred to different bitches. They kind of need they kind of stamp their their look upon them. So it, again, it's studying the pedigrees, looking at the dogs, <laughs> knowing the good and the bad that they're throwing, and and researching it. Uh, you know, you can't really say one. The bitch is definitely dominant or the stud's definitely dominant. It can vary. But you got to remember that there's a lot of dominant traits that can come that can come from the second or third generation. It doesn't have to be just mom and dad. You could, you, you know, there are some stud dogs out there that their grandchildren, you can tell in a second. So, right. And that's you where, know, again, studying the pedigrees and knowing that that's what they're throwing. You know, they, right. like you said, the stud dogs throws backwards. He's right. going to throw something that looks like behind him. Right. So again, it's, it's talking and learning and looking. Brett, do you have any thoughts on that? You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm muted because I have comments coming from my Dogs. Is the peanut gallery is chiming in? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the bitches that you know when you get the bitches that that you are so fortunate to have gotten uh, when you're starting out, and uh, and then and and then you breed them, uh, they, they definitely have every impact on how your things come along. And you bring in stud dogs that you don't have to own, but you can you can participate in them with with just by writing a check but having a female that, that you're actually going to produce puppies from and i i think that marks your line really so yeah and don't keep a puppy unless you absolutely have to that's not better than one of the parents that's a, that's a good rule of thumb, actually. Yeah. Interesting. Why go downhill? You know, you're always I mean, trying I, to move. Up. I have done. I've kept puppies that I got to attach to that I knew were not going to be better than their parents, but I always tried to keep better than what I had. But there again, you get down to how is that puppy going to mature? And if you have outcrosses, you're not going to know at what point that it's best to really make your decisions. So if you're talking about being better than, than the parents, I think you'd have to hold on to that puppy for quite a while. I do. That's that, again, that's the luxury. I usually would get down to one or two and I hold on to it. Six, seven months of age, I'd hold on to it. And then if it yeah. didn't turn out as an adult, I didn't place it as an adult. So I had that, that I, luxury. I don't think everybody, yeah, everybody doesn't have that luxury. So, you but know, you're I think people, 12, I think week keeping rule, 12 weeks gives you a, a really play in, but good I don't idea. know that at that point you could tell um, that they're better than if you know generations, you might have an inclination. You know, yeah, if you'd seen yeah, their mother, right. if you'd seen their father, and they were part of yours, and you have pictures and information what they looked at like at that age, you might be making, I can say, an educated guess. <laughs> Every breeding, you know your females, and every breeding, you 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 you're looking to correct something, to uh, improve something, and and you you kind of go into the stud for that, and you and hopefully it, it does uh, present itself to you. And so, if you had a problem you were after, and it's and all of a sudden this puppy has uh, the front that you were hoping for, the feet or whatever, you know, uh, that might be the only good thing about that puppy. <laughs> But it yeah. is what you're kind of looking for, and, and you yeah. got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's not the only good thing. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, exactly. If, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have a you puppy mean. that's got what you've been looking for, then that may be the puppy you need to keep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And cross back in with something else later on of your stuff. So Kelly Lockwood asked, if you have a sire that produces rear dew claws, would you remove him from your uh, breeding program? No, I just removed no. the rear dew claws. <laughs> yeah, right. I, no. I think we've only ever had <laughs> one puppy that I can remember. And we took them off. You know? I, had, yeah. I think I've had three or four. And frankly, I take off the front ones too. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just take them off. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was, I think that was a pretty bad answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take them off. Take them off. Yeah. Unless you're in a country that won't allow it. But anyway, I still would not remove the dog from. I guess I would project. ask Kelly. Kelly, what, what is the reason? Do you, what do you think? And, and Kelly, you can come off mute to answer. Okay. Um, I ask this because um, I call on a dog up in Canada where you cannot remove the dew claws. Okay. Uh, so, you know, so he was removed from the breeding program because mm. you're not going to show a dog with rear dew claws. I mean, I don't think it's a um, disqualification or, right? Not that I know can't of. You, no, can't no. you remove them in the United States and then show them in Canada? <laughs> I mean, he, he could visit. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's already been done. But right. um, yeah, that, you know, and especially with COVID, they couldn't right. get mm -hmm. anything across the border and who's going to hold on to puppies and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, so, uh, I mean, that's, my that's question would be, you knew it was a stud that was doing it, not maybe back in the bitch line, too. <clears throat> I didn't have the dog, so <laughs> I'm, going, I'm just saying, you yeah, know, we, right. I'm going with the with the co-breeder. Right. And I think she knows her line. She's been breeding for a, a long time. So Does she, get a lot of that? she had like three or four puppies with the <laughs> rear dew claws out of a couple different litters. So yeah. it wasn't just one litter, it was, you know, a couple different litters. With the same sire. With the same sire. Yeah. I guess it's a concern that if you're in a Canadian a CKC situation, it yeah. might be a concern that she might have. So anyway, you know, he's in a great pet home. And... Why are we echoing? <laughs> I, I, I think it's fixed. Somebody needed to mute. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just want to add on the Embark channel, Embark has a, a gene for rear dew claws, so you can, you can see it if they have the gene for it. Do you know if that's valid in beagles, Rachel? I've seen yeah. that, but I've never really paid any attention. It yes, it's absolutely, online. it's absolutely valid, and it's a dominant trait. It means that you need only one parent to produce it. That's correct, one parent. Uh, yeah, would so the parent it's a, have to have would the parent just, have to have the dew claws then to produce it? The rear no, dew claws? No. Yeah, yeah. So one of the parents okay. have to have dew claws to produce it. That's it. Simple I've like that. From, I've had them Oleg from dogs that don't have rear dew claws, but their grandfather had rear dew claws. Uh, probably they were very carefully removed. You know, no, because I've had them in my litters that I've had my litters that I had the parents and grandparents and I had one puppy with a rear dew claw or two puppies and none of the parents ever had a, it was like, I mean, it'd have to go back three or four generations for that too. And it was my dog. So I've kind of experienced the same thing Laura has. Interesting. And it would usually only be on, on one of them was on one only. The other one was on two only. And one of them had the rear dew claw that almost looked like a, half of a toe it was huge oh yeah some of them are big and meaty but then you've yeah. got those little ones that just kind of hang off yeah you know but yeah I, yeah that's why i asked because after that generation two more generations after that i never mm -hmm. got any <laughs> deb next question um are we getting beagles that are getting too coarse and heavy now we're we're getting beagles that have problems everywhere you know <laughs> you, you've got some that are too coarse and some that that are too light boned you know i don't think i don't think that that's as big a problem as shoulders and the short legs right now and you also because we're this is in many countries what here in America, we might consider it a little bit too big and heavy. In England or Europe or Australia, it may not be considered a little big and heavy. So I think that's, again, depending on what country you're in, what your standards you are. And I totally agree with Lori. Uh, yeah. Lack of substance is just as part of a concern as too much substance. And 
no angles front and rear. I mean, what's good of a bulldog on a stick? <laughs> Pat on a stick. Yeah, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. front or or look like little pingo sticks. There's no no bone or muscle or substance to it. You know, I think, so, I think there's some that are cool, some that aren't coarse, and and you know, for those you just breed away from what the problem is, but. In the way of at the top of the list, I think that um, definitely the front ends and the and the short legs are more of a concern than, you know, just simply saying, are they getting more coarse? I think that's a sometimes. Usually, and, and this is just something that when I'm watching beagles at ringside or when I was judging, if I look at a beagle and say, hmm, is that right? Whether it be tail set or ear set or too much bone or not enough bone. If it draws my attention to it, it makes me wonder, okay, is that right? What's then probably my eyes been drawn to something that's not right. If you question it in your mind, okay, is that beagle too tall or is that beagle how hot? Usually there's something there that's pulling your eye that you need to take that second look at. So oh, if you're looking at a dog and thinking it's too big, is that too big and coarse? Then probably it is. <clears throat> I think that's the same is true though. First, so I I find when I look at a ring full of dogs, I look for the ones that stand out that to me, you know, really look good, and those are the mm -hmm. ones that I look closer at. Oh yeah, I agree. But I'm just saying, as you're looking at that rings of ring of dogs, you are going to see those really oh, yeah. nice ones that draw your eye to them, like oh wow. But as you look down the ring, you're going to go oh wait, okay, well I got to look at that closer. That something don't look right there. And you keep going. I mean, it's just, it works both ways. I agree. I've seen dogs yeah. that are close and, and it's, it's like, just like Lori said, it, it's equally as offensive as dogs that are too fine bone. It, it, you know, we're all looking for this balance and uh, we like a lot of bone. So, uh, but if you get too much bone that the balance is lost, it's really not hard to see. I mean, I, and it's not functional. Yeah, I remember Terry Gianetti back in uh, Tucson bringing up that at that seminar that we had out there that are, are the dogs getting, like you said, losing their functional nest, their ability right. to run and be and be elegant and movement and and, and oily when they're moving. You know, and we don't want tanks going around. So I can see how people would ask that question. Who's talking? It wasn't me. That's Jessica. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> One of the things that we, on what you were saying, Brett, is when you look at the functionality of a beagle, they're going to be working in the field, which means they're, they're kind of an endurance hound. And if you relate that to where I started with the horse world, you know, you look at a quarter horse versus a thoroughbred. I, I kind of go toward the quarter horse look a little bit more because I feel like they're more agile and they were bred to short burst, but work with the cows all day. Work. So that's kind of my, you know, you, you want a thoroughbred look or a quarter horse look? You know, yeah, you little like muscle. Sturdy. Agility, able yeah. to bend, flex, you know, have some sense. So that's kind of where I came from. Well, they've got to be efficient in the field. They've got to be able to cover ground and they've got to be able to maintain and they've got to be able to do it for years. There's a question on here about, I see on the chat about gay tails. I don't know if I'm um, jumping ahead, but I'm looking at the chat. Everybody's nemesis. I agree with her just from the some of the things that I've seen online. There seems to be more gay tails in the show ring. Now, I have not been to a lot of shows. So other people have to talk, but watching some of the video, I do think we're seeing more gay tails than we used to. Well, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, there were tons of gay tails. You know, back in the 60s, you could, they, you know, they, they didn't call them the gay tails, they call them the teapot tails, and they were bouncing right off their back, and they were everywhere. And I think it's because people weren't as into genetics back then. 
I think that they didn't realize that those bad tales, I'll tell you, it take, you just can't get rid of those bad tales for generations upon generations. They pop up usually on the best dog. Um, but I think that we're going backwards. I think we're headed back to the 60s where the gay tales were everywhere. And now I'm beginning to see a comeback in them. Okay. I, and I guess it's like you say, Lori, the lines that we started out with didn't have them. And I never really, I don't remember ever showing a dog with a gay tail. Uh, or, yeah, but you saw a lot of them. Yeah, you Come see on. them and, and they, you know, like we look at the point schedule at five points <laughs> and, and you say, well, oh, should it really matter? Uh, you can't win with a tail down and you can't win with a tail on the back. You know, either one is bad. And, uh, uh, in judges, it just, just spoils the look of the dog. Yeah, right. It does. In in doing um, mentoring um, with judges, it's a very difficult area, at least for me, to deal with because when you're speaking to potential judges in the future, as a breeder, I hate bad tails, and bad tails will take a take a dog or bitch out of a breeding program in a second for me. However. When you go to judge, it's a portion. It's one third of five points. So it's like a point, point seven five in the, in the judging schedule. So when you're talking to judges ringside, I always tell them honestly that. I say, you know, when you're judging them, you know, it's a point plus off, off the hundred. Um, but understand that breeders hate it, you know, and it's very dominant. And if we're judging breeding stock, it's important. Yeah, I mean, once you get it's it, it's it's the very like difficult. Lori said, it's it's hard to get back it out. I mean, it's it's it can be a, a problem. Well, and on those same lines, what about tails that don't have a brush or the toilet bowl brush? <laughs> well, we the toilet the bowl toilet brush toilet. is most of the time <laughs> manufactured by somebody on the tail with a brush and hairspray and shaving it. I'm sorry. Right. I right. mean, I've had been fortunate to have one that had a natural brush and I didn't have to do anything to it. But most of the ones you see in the ring that looked like a scared raccoon tail cat, if you tried to touch it, it stick in your hand like a pin push it, cushion because it's it's manufactured and I hate it. And I think it just shows that it's a stupid handler. I'm sorry yeah, for no being honest, but that's the way I feel. I, I, I like I like a brush. Everybody does. And sometimes it, you don't have as much as you want, but no. it's, it's got to be natural. It's. No, I don't know it's why the you're extreme, saying, though. What if there's no brush? That's uh, one of the well, problems that, you got to breed that, away from. It's right, not something yeah, that's to throw really out. No coated dog. Yeah. That's and you're going to try to breed away from a coated dog. So you that that answers that. I mean, it's a fault. It's a seal coat. Like Lori said, it's a seal coat. It, a gorgeous seal coat. I'm not going to throw out of the program. She won't be a special. Right. But definitely breeding. Right. We've got five dogs and, uh, and, and one of them has a pretty short coat. And it took her to till she was about two or so before I thought the brush was acceptable. You know, it, it just came very slowly. Uh, it's not great, but it's not something I'd throw out at all. Right. And also remember those of us in the South, especially those of us down here at the very tip of Florida and probably the people in Texas, you've got, you've got code issues that you can't compete with the dogs up North certain times of the year because I they just imagine. don't carry the coat that the dogs up North carry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was a question on here that I think, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, and I'm, I think I missed it. Uh, and I think Ann Wolf had a question about. Well, let Deb, because Deb, let Deb. Okay. I'm sorry, Deb. Well, I don't. Um, and then of I course I forget to unmute the myself. Questions. Um, let me go back up and make sure we're covering all of them. Um, one of the, one of the ones, let's see. So Vargab uh, asked, uh, where'd it go? I lost it. I lost it. Um, what about inbreeding? You know, is there 
you know, are there, there it is. Um, how much inbreeding coefficient is safe and acceptable and what level of inbreeding or line breeding is too much? I, I'm going to say, number one, it depends on the lines. Number two, it depends on the breeder. What risks are you willing to take in doing so? Because if you're not real sure of, you know, a four and five generations back on those dogs that you breed, you're inbreeding, then you are going to magnify not only the good, but you're going to magnify the bad. And as a breeder, you've got to be prepared to be honest with yourself and look at that and say, boy, this was a disaster. You also, there's lots of weird things that can happen. So again, it depends on the two dogs you're breeding. It depends on the health and temperament of the dogs behind it. And it depends on the level of risk that the breeder wants to take. I've seen some good grandfather, granddaughter breedings that look great. Then I've seen some that was just disaster areas. And then I've seen some accidental brother, sister breedings that produce wonderful. Again, like Lori said, it's knowing the risk and evaluating the puppies. And if there's a lot of genetic <coughs> garbage that you know about, then maybe you don't want to get too close. We, we, we had one litter that I comes to mind a long time ago. We named the puppy we kept Dark Secret, and that was the Dark Secret. It was inbred. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a great puppy. It was a super puppy. It's just what you're saying. You're doubling up on your good stuff. And I, I, I would be, it's a risk. It's a, it's, I think too risky to do too much. And if you so. do it, a lot of times at that point, you plan to go out the next oh, generation. Way out. Okay. You go out. Yeah. You know, back in the, back in the late sixties and early seventies, there was a lot of uh, father and daughter, grandfather and daughter, um, son and mother, there were all kinds of breedings like that because you had, it was a different era back then and you didn't have a lot of dogs to choose from like you've got today. You also didn't have the access to them. And back at the end of Triple Threat's life, everybody wanted to breed to Trippy, and everybody who had Trippy puppies wanted to breed the daughters back to him. In other words, they wanted to capture Trippy while he was still alive. And, you know, at the end of his life, he lost his rear leg. They had to amputate it. And he was still breeding bitches on one hind leg. Um, so, I, I mean, there was a lot of that that went on <coughs> back then. And I'm sure, I mean, mine was the triple threat era, but the other people may have others. There might've been a lot of people breeding close on, pr on pruny, trying to get puppies back out of pruny. And, you know, any of the big dogs back then, because there weren't a lot of great dogs back then. Double exposure was inbred. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had an inbred prune guy that we bought. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and she was a, really did well for us again. Right. Uh, so, so, but we didn't breed her, we bought her. Yep. So Ann Wolf asked, what reasons would make you do a planned C-section? <laughs> <laughs> that well, is a sticky wicket. I'll jump into that brush pile first yeah. and anybody else can well, come I'll in and like the match on the brush pile. Oh, my number one reason if I had to do a plan C section would be the fact that I did not have adequate emergency vet coverage. And if I got into trouble, they'd spay my bitch. Oh, uh, and I know some people are having to deal with that. If I had <laughs> adequate emergency vet coverage, I would only do a plan C section if I knew that the bitch had, had trouble whelping a litter prior and you had to have a section or got into trouble, or if I knew I had one huge puppy and a small bitch, uh, I would not plan a C-section out of convenience. Uh, I would do it if there was only complications or if that I wasn't 100% sure that I had a reputable vet that could do an after hours emergency C-section. Scheduled C-sections scheduled C -sections for me are if I have a bitch that I'm unsure of on whether or not she can have the puppies, I usually have an x-ray usually the day or two before the due date just to see where everything is and the size of the puppies versus the size of the opening. 
if I have to go on a weekend, then if I'm going to chance it on a weekend, I want to make sure I, I've got plenty of resources on hand. But I'll usually schedule a C-section if I have a, the slightest doubt about it, I will schedule a C-section. But I usually do progesterone, so I usually know what the due dates are. I'm less likely to schedule and do it without the bitch coming in labor um, if it's one I don't have progesterone on. Then, I, then they have to come into labor. I mean, the emergency costs at emergency clinics right now are $3,000 plus if you walk in and do a spay, I mean, a, a C-section, and they're going to want to spay at the same time. There's very few vets these days that, um, that don't. So, you, you know, know, I've had vets tell me that that wasn't true, and I've tried to give them documentation, and they say that that's actually against all the veterinarian policies to make it you is. have to have a C-section spay. Um, it is but because it happens. That's the worst, it happens. That's the worst time to stay. Yeah, I, I, you know, hey, coming from a vet, I would do anything but rather than spay the bitch in a C-section. But it's the ER. The vets, risks are yeah. too high. Mm -hmm. I it's know. The, I, I've heard. It's the ER vet. But that's not the best medicine for a dog unless there's a reason to spay them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I totally agree. I don't. I don't want to see. The art of whelping lost in this next generation of beagle people. There is an art to whelping bitches. And I know people say, oh, you know, all these different things and, <laughs> you know, worry about this and worry about that and mm -hmm. might lose a puppy. But, you know, there is an art to whelping. And when that art's lost, we might as well just say our, our breed is a C-section breed. And that is just, to me, tragic for our breed that... Oh, I think we're are anywhere afraid to near, welcome. We're not anywhere near that yet, though. The most, uh, the most of the ones that need to have a C-section, at least speaking from experience on my end, are ones that have a blockage. Um, you have the birth canal blocked, and um, and they have to have a C-section. Or, you know, again, passively, if I have to do a C-section because one's due on Sunday, and I don't trust her to get there. And I'm not gonna, I don't wanna have to pay $3,000. But what it means is it's a lot of extra work for me. Well, I think, you know, Laura, you're in one basket, but just talking to a lot of different people and different areas and, and being aware of, of different things going on, there are a number of people that just absolutely do scheduled C-sections, period. And they don't let the bitch go into labor. Well, I know John schedules C-sections. All his bitches have C-sections. I mean, and he I talked just, about that. I just think he that's that's not that doing our breed uh, justice. I think we need to know who our free whelpers are and who they aren't. And we need to mentor these people in the art of whelping puppies and getting puppies out. I mean, uh, the and Shaws could get puppies out like crazy. I mean, they, they just knew how to do it. And right. uh, I just think that that's my personal opinion. Brett. Right. What do you think? We haven't had a litter for a long, long time. And uh, back in the day, uh, I think if we had a bitch that we knew had mm -hmm. a history of needing a section uh, due to an emergency section, then we, we would schedule that. Uh, we, we, I don't know if we had subsequent mm -hmm. bitches have a, a litter naturally after, after a, a section. But we had a lot of sections and they were all emergency. <laughs> but the difference was the vet would be our vet. He would meet right. us mm -hmm. day or night at the hot, at the veterinary clinic. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were $300, you know, yeah. so that's why I said, I think the ah! first consideration is what kind of vet coverage do you have? Mm -hmm. I had the luxury that you had, Brett. My vet was always on call. He lives four miles from my house. I could call him at two or three o'clock in the morning and he'd come in and do a C-section at three or four. I don't have that anymore. I'm not breeding, but I don't have that anymore. The only thing we've got in emergency clinic that he has told me point blank, don't take your bitch there. Go to the one that's an hour away. Hey, so okay. if I had a bitch that was in whelp close to it, I would probably, I don't know what I'd do. I mean, I can't say I wouldn't plan a C-section, but I would try to let them go into labor before I did the C-section if possible, but uh, you have to weigh it. So those days are gone, but there's still an art to whelping. And I don't want to see that art lost. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree also. 
No, so I'm not saying don't do a plan C section because everybody's got their own situation. Um, <laughs> I have people that would come over that would help, help help me whelp dogs. I'd go and help other people whelp other breeds. You know, I, I delivered calves. I delivered <laughs> horses. Uh, we don't have that in some of the younger generation. Maybe some of the us as the older generation need to help them learn how to do some of this, how to turn a puppy, how to grab a foreleg and pull it out or push a head back. You know, we've well, all been in that situation. You know, we, we the, the problem is when we have people who, uh, you know, Stacy posted and she said, you know, she's in North Dakota, you know, there's, there's not people that can come help. And, you know, it, it makes it very challenging and very scary. Yeah. But we Everybody got a video. Has- we can zoom it. Every- okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. A zoom, everybody, zoom delivery. Everybody, yeah. Everybody kind of has their own take on it, you know, and everybody knows what, what things are available and the resources they've got in the area they're in to make their decision. You know, right. we can't hold judgment for or against anybody not right. knowing what their situation, is. but I agree with Darlene that we don't want to lose the natural whelping ability in our business, but I don't think we're close to that. So Deb, Let's more questions. Here. We've got, we've only got about five minutes left because okay. I want to try and keep this as to as much two time as, as possible. Um, because, and, and like I said, we'll do these again. I think these are very, very helpful. I just want to say, Stacey, um, if you get a litter coming and you need somebody on the phone, call me. <laughs> I don't mind saying, okay, do this or do that. Um, I think all three of these were questions we did at the national. I have three left. And, um, what traits good and bad are easiest and hardest to fix or retain? We talked about some of the things already like tails, um, I don't know if there's anything else yeah, you guys want. Upper arms. <laughs> yeah, it's the fronts that to me are, they're golden they're when they're good. And I think, the, I, I agree everything. I think the easiest thing to fix is probably the rear. I, I think, think heads. Easiest to fix heads? Yes, I think, I think she's right. I, I Maybe, but I think rears are easier to fix. I think you can get some more angles in a rear better than you can get angled in the front well you can but you still you can't fix that one generation you can fix the head in one generation kelly kelly's having help as she's typing um she says are white haws easy to breed out no no (laughs) that's an easy answer (laughs) i've never had much of white haws to begin with so i have to say i don't know Nope, not easy to breed nope. out because it's in so many pedigrees now that you may, your bitch may not have it, but if the sire's carrying it, then you're going to get at least one puppy in the litter with a white haw. Do the white haws bother us? No, I don't. Th- they do me because I think it interferes with the dog's expression. And, exactly. you know, I don't want to see that lazy little haw sitting there. But can, can you tell round, us what a haw is? D- describe that for some of our newbies. <laughs> it's when it's when the white in their eye comes up and covers a little corner of their eye. Oh, I have one. It's, Let me see if I can get it on the screen because I have one that has it. it drives me yeah. nuts. OK, it's an un, it's unpigmented is what the problem is. The right. third eyelid, usually the top of it's brown and it right. doesn't have pigment. What are and you doing? That, it, it usually looks a little bit bluish. Here and we go. Here comes, comes our model. eyelids like Bassett's have when it looks I, like I've got one or two here that have them too. As long as yeah. you have really tight eyelids. Yeah. If your eyelids are really tight, a lot of times you don't notice them as much. So there you can see <laughs> on Lindsay's dog the white. Also, control, also help with cherry eye. If you don't have a loose eye, then you're, yeah. you're better off to not get cherry eyes too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's this, no, it's this side. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, right, right there in the, the kind yeah. of the corner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The corner. Now, you know, she's got gorgeous mascara and a gorgeous shape of the eye and gorgeous eyes. And that one little bit, just it'll draw your eye to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that white just sucks your, your attention. Oh, okay, yeah, draws your right. eye to it. I see it every time I look at her. Yeah, yep, yep. she's, still got, so so, many she's more. got gorgeous eyes and gorgeous expression and nice mascara. 
Share that <clears throat> wine, Lindsay. Share that wine. <laughs> wine? We had wine? <laughs> Lindsay had wine. I saw her take a sip, and now I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, she got the I whole bored. bottle there for us. Yeah, that's right. But no, so, but so very hard stuff to get rid of. But, you know, in my personal opinion, as much as I try to get rid of them, there's a lot of other things that come in front of it. Yeah. Like health issues, mm -hmm. you know. Or like spooks. We had yeah. some cherry that eyes. Years ago. Tail down. We had some cherry some eyes years ago. That's a big problem. I mean, mm -hmm. if yep. when you have it. Uh, yep. So a white, white haw is. It is like it's just appearance. I mean, it's it's not the end of the world, but I don't it's like it either. I think they heard the expression. Oh, yeah, Oleg sharing, Oleg showing somebody off. I love this for you to see everybody's babies. Oh, see, I can't see them. Me neither. Oh, that's uh, yeah. Eyes are not open yet. <laughs> oh, we we have no peepers. <laughs> no peepers. Oh, there's everybody. I can see them now. Yep. So I okay. can't see anybody except well, and, and it should it, when in the recording you should be able to see everybody. Um, which right now we have thirty five people. Um, you know, and and I think that is obviously showing that this is a, a lot of interest. Um, you know, I, what do we think quarterly? Would that be good to to have something I like think this, this quarterly? Needs to be more of a discussion. Maybe have okay. the answers ahead of time. Okay, I don't think. This needs to be us old farts out here. I think that everybody <laughs> should be able to talk about things. No, not Deb. Not Deb. I'm talking oh. about me and Brad oh. <laughs> and Darlene. <laughs> Somebody's getting kisses there. <laughs> I no. know. I, I agree, though. If, if, if uh, we have a problem, oh, I, say, if we can all sit down on the patio here in our own house and, and really talk about it, mm -hmm. maybe we can help fix some stuff mm -hmm. maybe and we, we can have fireside chats right, right. right like right. you know like brett says one night just everybody come in and chat with him and then another night you know we mm. chat this mm -hmm. and and like we're talking about whelping you know, we've got the technology now that if somebody's whelping and they don't have somebody yeah. to hear, there's easily somebody that can be on the other you know right. on the microphone not on the microphone on the video say it okay try this or try that mm -hmm. or you know it's okay Right. Um, yeah. Sometimes you just don't want to be alone. Right, I mean, that's right. the, mm -hmm. you know, and if you have that and, and same thing with evaluating puppies, I mean, we've got so much technology it used to be, we take a picture, go to the store, get the film developed, you know, <clears> now <throat> we can just do it kind of instantaneously mm -hmm. and show videos. And, and I think that's just one of the great things, even with having puppies that <coughs> we're going to place as pets. And on my last litter, mm -hmm. I, every night at certain time all my potential pet puppy would come on would come on and i'd sit down with a video and i'd show them how i was handling the puppies and mm -hmm. and how to train them not to bite and that was so valuable because we met an interaction between me and the people that were going to get my puppies mm -hmm. and we right. maintain that friendship right you know and and i would be more than happy to schedule however many of these we want um you know and and if we want to do ones where they're you know a specific topic what do you um, want this one was was really pretty general and and winding right. um you know if you would want to you know show puppies and their temperaments and and things like that i mean you know like i said i'm i am more than happy to schedule however what? many of these we want even if we just have two or three people who participate i think that's valuable also um you know we've got this technology we've got the ability then well, we should use it i think you know it, it, scheduling was great but i and i think it's wonderful we can record them mm -hmm. but there's i think times when maybe just even if it was privately two or three people mm -hmm. that got together yep. you know just new questions with, a, mm -hmm. with some questions and sat down with a couple of people you can do a face chat mm -hmm. group or something like that where you do right. two or three people on facetime yep um to yeah, because when we yeah. record these, some people might be a little hesitant to say some things. Right. And, you know, so, you know, that would give people an avenue to, to take advantage of some of us old farts that aren't going to be around much in the show ring anymore. Not I'm just talking about myself and and, uh, <laughs> uh, and pick our brains and mm -hmm. make and we may learn things, too. I mean, mm -hmm. that, I'm I'll learn till the day I die. Oh. Uh, Sorry, that's my chihuahua bark. Every single, every single litter of puppy uh, puppies I have, I learned something new. Mm. You never stop learning 
new things. And it's so interesting because it's like, okay, that's what this litter is going to be known for. But um, puppies are a wonderful thing. Ooh, I mean, oh. I love, I love just raising the puppies. I love it. Well, let's see. I am, oh, oh. I'm going to save, oops, somehow I lost the chat. Um, I'm going to save the chat. So that way, if we didn't cover questions, you know, we might be able to, to just do some of those online. And, you know, it, it's going to take me a couple of days to get this posted, um, you know, and, and uh, so we will be doing that. Uh, but, but yeah, thank you, everyone. And, and especially thank you to our panelists. Thank you to uh, Deb for coordinating all of this and working with our panelists. You know, it's great just to see everybody, right? You know, it's we, when we're at nationals, sometimes we're just going 900 miles an hour. And so this is kind of fun just to see everybody. Um, uh, you know, uh, do we have anybody who has any final thoughts that they want to make sure we, we talk, you know, that they, they say before we jump off? Okay, you have to I take yourself off mute. <laughs> nobody, nobody. Deb, Deb, <laughs> mm -hmm. just, just for those of us on the West Coast, because I got off work 10 minutes ago, mm -hmm. so I didn't get to see any of the I know, it's, it's hard, you know, because I'm like, okay, how late do we want to go, <laughs> you know, for, for, you know, the, the you know, and, and we actually have, Kalina is even an hour later than, than we are. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got five different time zones that we're trying to cover. Um, yeah. And, and, and I believe we do have someone in China and um, Aaron is on too. So I think, I think awesome. we might have Australia. So yeah, that, that, and so what we might do is maybe some, well, I'd, I'd say weekends, but everybody's at shows then, um, you know, and, and so we'll try, you know, to, to accommodate the, the various time zones. Um, yeah. you know, it, it does, it gets a little challenging, um, but we'll, we'll try. Hey, Deb, late, mm -hmm. if you want to do more of these panels, late, late is fine with me. I don't know about Brett, but you know, late is fine. Mm -hmm. So that would be better for the West coast mm -hmm. people. Yeah. I mean, we could start at nine Eastern and, mm -hmm. you know, I'll try to not snore. Um, and, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that way we could at least get the California folks maybe home after, after their work. Another thing we might could do is I'm thinking of some of the old interviews that used to be done in the Beagle magazines mm -hmm. is sit down and do interviews with specific people. Just like, I know not, not to bring highlights to you, Carrie, but you have whelped a lot of litters. And I think some of your breeding knowledge and whelping knowledge mm -hmm. and how to manage whelping bitches is, is and Lori too, but especially, you know, you're kind of on the West coast and we're kind of on the East coast having a, like a, a, a question and answer period where specific questions that you can answer Carrie about what do you do in this situation mm -hmm. and then maybe have one or two and record those it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be you know 15 or 20 people because mm -hmm. I remember when they interviewed like the Moose Ladens and they talked in depth and they yeah. interviewed um you know Carol Diaz I go back and read those interviews mm -hmm. and I always glean something else out of it so yeah. uh, that may be something we could do is an interview type mm -hmm. thing. Well, yeah. I, I do I, interviews all week, so okay. I'd be more than happy to, to do any of that. And, and I mean, to me, this is fascinating. I, I love learning mm -hmm. all of this and, and, you know, I, I hope that everybody is, is, you know, getting as much out of it. So I, this is, I've been suggesting this idea for years and in part, Darlene, because I miss those meet the breeder articles mm, that right. were so lengthy. I, it was just very interesting to mm -hmm. hear. And, you know, we just lost Kathy Forbes mm -hmm. and we lost Elise and we lost mm -hmm. Bob Booth and, and all of those people, all of that knowledge mm -hmm. that's gone and they've contributed so much to the breed. And, you know, if we have an opportunity like this to um, get them recorded and, and be able to share that mm -hmm. for future generations, what a great thing for us to be able to, to try to do. So, um, and, and everything, everything that everyone else has to contribute mm -hmm. to, I think I, I'm, I'm excited that we're giving this a try. And we have a lot of people with really good talents. Mm -hmm. Some are, you know, excellent handlers or mm -hmm. others of us sometimes can't put two feet in front of each other. We can always get tips from those people that have those special talents to maybe help us better at where we're going. Mm -hmm. And, and we've got the technology to do it. So let's see how we can do it and let them live on and help us 
down the road. Cool. Well, then what I'm going to ask, because I do want to wrap it up, is I think we, you know, it, 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 we're getting ready to go into the holidays. And so I don't think it's really feasible to try and do anything for the rest of the year. But please send me your suggestions. You know, if you would if you would be willing to be interviewed, to be a panelist, to, you know, all those things, uh, let me know or if there's topics you want to know. So I'm pretty easy to find. You know, you can uh, message me. You can, you know, put it on, on uh, you know, there's, yeah, you're, yeah I'm, I'm pretty, pretty easy to, to find. So, you know, make sure sure that you know, you'd let me know what you want and, and we will do everything we possibly can to, to make this happen. Deb? Yes. Deb, one, uh, one thing I think would be very useful to put on a Zoom would be um, Rachel and who is the other person? Mandy? Mandy? That's yes. doing the- Our uh, new hunt one. Our new hunt program. <laughs> Oh, I that would be very Zoom, interesting. Mm-hmm. A Zoom conversation with them would be mm-hmm. wonderful so that we could all learn from them about, okay. about what it takes to be there. Sure. Um, Rachel, I think you're still on. Don't let me forget to, that that's a topic we want to, to add. So cool. Well, everybody, thank you so much for participating um, and, and joining us. This is great fun. We've got, you know, lots of, of great content going forward. <laughs> You know, I think this is going to be a, a, it's something that, that we really will benefit from. So thank you so much. Thank you to people who participated from outside the U.S. Um, you know, that's always fun when we have people from everywhere. Uh, you know, and, and so as I said, I, I saved the chat. So if we didn't get questions answered, we can hopefully do that. <laughs>